Pastor Ronnie Wesley, everybody not see, and Pastor Evan Horton. And so we're going to call Pastor Horton uh, to do our invocation. Pastor Horton. Would you stand with me as we pray? Lord, we thank you for the privilege it is to be here in this nation. We pray for our country. We ask, Lord, that you watch over us and keep everyone safe. We pray for our state, that you watch over this great state of Florida. And help us, O oh Lord, in all the issues that we're dealing with here. But Lord, we also pray for Pensacola, and particularly tonight for Brownsville. And we thank you, Lord, for the privilege it is to be here in the panhandle of Florida. We have our issues as well, but Lord, we know that we are strong because we work together. We have our differences, we can share our opinions, but we want to unite together to see good things happen. Yeah. We pray particularly over our schools, our administration, our teachers, and our students. Keep them safe, O oh Lord. We ask your blessing upon this night. Be with Commissioner May as he chairs and works this through with all of those that are here tonight as well. We thank you for the elected officials being here and helping share all the things that we're going to hear that we get to ask questions for. And so we give you the honor and glory. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Horton, and the great work of uh, this wonderful building uh, was the result of the great work that the Brownsville Church did, and now the county has the building. Uh, before we start, uh, we certainly want to recognize our, our partners who are here, uh, who are, are activists. Uh, obviously, we have the Brownsville's Neighborhood Association, Michael Jackson, and, and, and that group. We, we really appreciate you being here. Uh, we have ECC, uh, Ms. Sandra Smiley, Ms. Sandra Donaldson. ECC has moved into Brownsville to provide health care. Uh, and so today you may have some health care questions, uh, and they will be here. We just stand as, as, so people can recognize you. Uh, for, for being here. <laughs> Affordable housing is a big deal, and I'm happy to be a part with Aid Sync, Aid Area Housing, Aid in your staff. Would you please stand? And, 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 Questions about affordable housing, uh, and getting there, hey, we certainly appreciate you. Uh, without a doubt, uh, the most instrumental group for me uh, is a bunch of uh, ladies, and sometimes I call them biddies, and sometimes I call them kitties. Uh, uh, the Evanwood Neighborhood Association. We appreciate them. <laughs> Mike Kilmore is here with the Brownsville Association. Uh, and is active in this association with Pastor Mike Kilmer and your group. Are you here, Mike? Please. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> uh, really, and I Thank you so much. Pastor Wesley just walked in late, and so he won't be able to do the invocation. But I walk in late at his church all the time, so I don't have to pay off him. Uh, so it's all good. Uh, we do have uh, the Brentwood Neighborhood Association, Mr. and Mrs. Licardo, who are here, who have fought with us at the homeless. Mr. and Mrs. Licardo, thank y'all so much for being here. <laughs> I think that Doug Fox and Office Kevin Brown should be at the head table. So, Kevin, if you are here, uh, Lee Rose, you can get a, a seat at the table for Kevin. We'll make sure that Kevin's at the table. From Senator Doug Roxon's office, Kevin Brown, thank you for being here. We have Ms. B. Thomas from the Minority Coalition Association. B, are you here? Ms. B, thank you so much for being here. We have Mr. Mike Lowry from our, our Area Transit Union. Mr. Light Rodman, thank you for being here. <laughs> Diane Cromwell from the Women DEC, thank you for being here. <laughs> Lisa D for showing up late and taking a seat. I mean, no real title, but thank you for being here. Mr. Rodney Jones from the NAACP is here tonight. We have Judge Smith, the Stanley County judge who's here, is not on the panel, Judge Smith, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Without further ado, I would like to introduce this panel and thank the great panel for being here. Uh, they have the opportunity uh, to bring elected officials together. And someone said, why don't you do it? I said, at the end of the day, everyone that's elected in our office works for the people. And so many times people think that municipalities, city, county, state attorneys, legislators don't work together. Well, this is an opportunity for you to come and talk to a circuit judge, a county judge, a tax collector, a state rep. And so your issues will be heard. And so tonight, uh, we're going to have given opportunity. There will be some written questions, some verbal questions, but more importantly, just a dialogue. And at the end of the day, we're not going to have a lot of questions. We're not going to throw any stones or any bricks at anyone. Uh, we can ask questions and we can be cordial. 
and at the end of the night, you're gonna get the opportunity to spend a few minutes one-on-one -on -one with each of these people. I wanna thank Judge Joyce Williams, First Judicial Circuit, for being here. I kind of judge, thank you, Judge, for being here. I'd like to thank our superintendent of school, Mr. Malcolm Thomas, for being here. This guy told me, he said, man, I'm usually at home about five o'clock. I don't do politics. I'm at home doing great stuff. He said, but, you know, this is important to me. Uh, and, you know, I'm very really honored, I mean, tonight to have Bill Eddings, our state attorney here. <laughs> My colleague, who I share this district with, uh, city council person who works very hard. I Many of you will have questions as we really work in the Brownsville area. Joel Canada Wing. <laughs> Next guy, I mean, I can say that he's a true friend. I've had the opportunity to coach his children. Uh, he really, really tipped the ballot and made me win my election. Uh, even though I didn't get enough votes from the Davis Staff Supervisor. <laughs> No, we really appreciate it. We really appreciate the student guys. I mean, the machines didn't work properly, but we bought them a new building in Brownsville. Make sure next time someone has a fair chance. Uh, school board, District 3, school representative, Lee Hansen. I don't know whether they call him Sheriff or Deputy Sheriff or whatever, but he's on a lot of billboards. Uh, but uh, Deputy Chip Simmons. Um, we have circuit judges and county judges, uh, but a person I found to be passionate about this community and, and really has a, a thriving to really want to correct uh, the wrongs that have happened and, and just a fair judge, Judge Dan Heiser. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. So all those crazy calls I get about fire, I mean, and about roads and about sewer and all that. I mean, many of you have not met him, but tonight I met my former school teacher, the Honorable Elvin McCarthy. <laughs> And because Jack Brown is not here and he makes a lot of money from the county and he's on vacation, he sent his assistant and so that's where Jackie, that's where our tax dollars went. But he had a good feeling, in, uh, someone who's been with the county a, a long time. Ms. Amy Lavoie, assistant county manager. <laughs> Sitting in, um, someone who's working with us on all the lighting programs and really makes things happen in Senator Block's office, Mr. Kevin Brown. Kevin, thank you for being here. <laughs> and the guy, all of y'all love to hate. The guy that takes your Avalon, takes all of your money, makes you pay taxes that you don't deserve to pay. Um, he, he works with Scott Jones to uh, uprise the property value so he can get all of your money so other politicians can spend it. Scott Lawson, from Tax Collector. Thank you, Scott. Really it. And so tonight, it's really about you. Thank you. Brother, you're a neighborhood association, brother, you're a church, brother, you're Lonnie Wesley, or other than Pastor Horton. Thank you for coming out to get engaged. Uh, this all started in a conversation uh, with Quint Studer about Civicon and civic engagement. And so tonight, uh, we, we, we want to be the trendsetters. We want to say this is your government. All of us work for you. And so you can ask your questions. And at the end of the night, there's some questions that you want, don't want to ask publicly. Uh, and so you're going to be able to get a one-on-one. -on -one. We're going to do about 45 or 50 minutes of questioning. Uh, and then you're going to be able to do some one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, this is not a political campaign. I'm not going to call out anybody's name that's running for office. You should spend your own money to get your own advertising. <laughs> but I will do it. If, if you're running for office, you can't stand. And you can just stand if you're running for elected office. If someone recognizes anybody that's running for elected office that's here, you, you, please stand. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for being here. At this time, this guy that I'm calling to facilitate this, and the reason he's facilitating, uh, because he is the voice of Pensacola politics. Uh, he recently wrote a book of City of Grudges, and it was a fiction book, but after reading it, I realized that it was nonfiction. Uh, and so there are a lot of us who have been pointing out in that book. But he loves this community. He writes about this community through the independent news and through Rick Blogs. He cares about how we move forward in this community, and he has his thumb on the pulse of everything that happened. So please join me in welcoming our facilitator for the night, my friend, Mr. Rick Allison. Mr. Allison. about Escambia County is our town halls. This is an opportunity for you to face your elected officials and to, for them to listen to you. It is uh, unique about Escambia County more so than any other place I've lived. So this is truly uh, a great night to be able to pull this off. My job is um, herding cats. So it's kind of like putting kittens in a box. One's going to pop out every now and then. 
But my goal is to try to move this as quickly as I can, give you an opportunity to ask questions, to be able to uh, pull it down just a little bit, uh, give you an opportunity to ask questions uh, and keep us moving. Uh, because I think the more questions we hear, the more we're going to learn. Uh, we'll do that. We'll go um, after we let each of the people on the panel give a two to three minute introduction, and you don't have to use the entire three minutes each. It'll be all right. Nobody will be upset. Uh, we'll open up. I'll have a few written questions that y'all have handed in, and then we'll open up to for y'all to come forward and do it. Uh, and I'll try to keep a pretty good uh, handle on the time for us. So. We'll go through that. Uh, Judge Williams, would you like to open up for us? Sometimes that may be a good thing, but hopefully not. Uh, I have uh, raised here in Pensacola. Um, I graduated from Washington High School, went to University of Florida, both undergrad and grad, uh, law school. I have been a practicing attorney since 1981, private practice here in Pensacola uh, initially. Then I went to Northwest Florida Legal Services, where I served before. And from there, I went to the uh, Scammy County Attorney's Office, and from there to City Attorney's Office. And for the last 13 years, I've been the Scammy County Court Judge, first black female appointed actually by Governor Bush. Uh, we tend and tend, we hear cases that are misdemeanors, meaning not punishable by more than one year in jail. That's how jurisdiction, uh, the jurisdiction of judges are divided. Uh, less than one year jail and fines not to exceed 1,000, although there's some issues about that going up as far as jurisdiction goes. Uh, so the type of cases we try are misdemeanors, bad checks, uh, driving offenses, DUIs, and so on and so forth. Uh, I can say that in the 13 years that I have seen an array of people uh, and circumstances, and I think in the 13 years what I've learned is it's a case-by-case -case decision. I personally don't believe necessarily in blanket uh, situations, decisions, and judges are prohibited from saying in any of them how we will rule. We're supposed to be fair, impartial, and hear what comes in front of us and listen to, listen to all the facts without undue pressure, political or otherwise. Uh, there will be a number of times when you may ask a question, you may not ask me any, but if you do, I may not be able to answer due to our canon of ethics. Uh, certainly we're held to a different standard than perhaps other elected officials. With that being said, I hope I didn't use up all my three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Malcolm. Malcolm Collins, Superintendent of Schools. I'm a product of the Escambia County School District, uh, attending first grade through 12th grade in our school system. I'm a U.S. Army veteran. I came back and had the opportunity to teach in the high school that I graduated from, Tate High School. I was Scandy County Teacher of the Year, finalist for Florida Teacher of the Year. I'm currently in the middle of my third term as superintendent of schools. We think we've seen a lot of progress and hopefully tonight we'll be able to talk about some of that as the meeting goes on. Uh, certainly, if you have questions about schools, uh, as you've already heard, if you, wanna, if you don't wanna ask those in the open forum, certainly I'll hang around and answer those after the meeting is over about specific students. Again, I will not be able to, to address specific students in an open forum, but I can talk to you one-on-one -on -one if it's your child and can help you with that. I am the grandfather now of six grandchildren, and if you don't believe God has a sense of humor, I grew up as the, as the oldest of four boys, not a sister in the house. God's given me two daughters, and I have six granddaughters, not a boy in the bunch. <laughs> Four of those grandchildren live in Escambia County. All four attend our public schools, and we're proud of what they accomplish. I'm Bill Evans. I'm the state attorney. We have jurisdiction over four counties, uh, Escambia, Santa Rosa, Okaloosa, and Walton. We have approximately 235 employees, approximately 80 assistant state attorneys. Uh, the largest county, of course, is Escambia, and more than half of my Offices here along the administration. 
we prosecute everything from fish being too short to death penalty murder cases. Uh, we have a very good record in comparison to the other offices throughout the state. We have a record of being very passionate about our support of victims and victims' rights. We have a number of victim advocates and we try to have tried, I've tried to develop a culture of uh, respecting, protecting, and supporting victims throughout my career. I've practiced law for 44 years uh, in Northwest Florida. I was a criminal pros young prosecutor, uh, an assistant, then I was a, a criminal defense lawyer for approximately 25 years, and I was elected state attorney uh, 13 years ago. I'm in my fourth term. I'm Jewel Calendar Wynn, and I grew up in Central Florida. Uh, Central High School Black Cats is, 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 was my school. I'm a military veteran of the United States Air Force. When I got out of the Air Force, I returned to Pensacola uh, and started working here in Pensacola. I started out as a probation officer and eventually was lured into education, and currently I'm a dean at Excambia High School as well as uh, City Council Member of District 7. I have uh, some, often at these town hall meetings, they ask me what the district is. I put some maps out in the front to show you what the districts are. However, you know, as a council member, you represent everyone, even if it's not in your district. I also want to uh, state that we work together as a, as a county and a city to get those issues done. Commissioner May uh, and I work together because it's gonna take a team effort for all of us to, to answer the challenges of our community. Good evening, uh, my name is David Stafford. I'm the supervisor of elections here in Escambia County. I am a Pensacola native, um, born just down the street here at uh, it's, uh, Baptist uh, Hospital. Um, I'm gonna take my time to talk to you briefly about a couple things we've got going on. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you to the citizens, you the citizens, uh, for providing this forum, and particularly this building. This building is paid for courtesy of your tax dollars. A uh, beautiful community center, um, which I'm proud to say, proud to announce here today, that we are utilizing uh, this community center, a room right behind me, uh, for an early voting location uh, for the 2018 uh, election cycle. So anybody from anywhere in the county, as long as you're registered to vote, uh, can come here right to this building uh, and cast their ballot in this upcoming important election cycle. I want to talk to you real briefly about it. Too often, people ignore non-presidential elections, whether it's a primary or, as we see in this, we're going to have a primary, but we're also going to have uh, a big general election. Uh, it's important for a whole host of reasons. First of all, the, for, the entire Florida cabinet is going to be uh, new because they are term limited out. Uh, we've got a United States Senate contest. We've got a congressional race. We've got two open legislative seats. Uh, we've got. Uh, county commission seats, we've got a mayor's race, we've got city council races, we've got school board races. In addition to all of that, once every 20 years this, this happens, we have eight constitutional amendments that were just authorized by the Constitutional Revision Commission. Well, it happens once every 20 years, and I can tell you that in, within that eight, there are multiple provisions in each one of those. So when you, I think when you count them up, there's 15 or so in those eight provisions. In addition, there's five additional amendments for a total of 13 amendments that will be on your ballot in November. Why am I telling you that right now? Start studying them right now. Because the last thing you want to do is walk into your polling place, walk into the Brownsville Community Center, and walk into the voting booth for the first time uh, when you get your ballot and read these things for the first time. Because we're not going to be able to help you. We're not going to be able to tell you what they mean. Okay, we can give you all the information, we can guide that for you, but you're going to have to do your homework and you're going to have to make those decisions for yourself. And be, be an informed voter, uh, be a prepared voter. Number one step is to get registered. Registers never, registering to vote's never been easy. My friend, my colleague down here at the end, Scott Lunsford, that's where we get most of our registration applications. People are often surprised at that. We get probably about 75% of our applications come through the driver's license office. Since October of 1 of last year, we now have fully online voter registration. You can do it from the comfort of your home, from your office, from a library, wherever you want to do it, you can do that. Or we'd always love to see you down at the office as well. But you got to get registered uh, before you can vote. Voting's never been easier. Got three ways, early absentee uh, and on election day. Um, so most important, be prepared, get ready, because it's an important election cycle. We want to see everybody uh, who's here in this room today cast a ballot. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, I'm Lee Hansen, and as soon as I get out of here, I promise I'm going to go study those uh, constitutional revisions. Um, I am the school, di school district representative uh, from District 3, and uh, unlike many of the folks up here, I am not a native Pensacolian, but my dad was. And we used to come here when I was a kid. He was an army officer, and he would bring us back here, and we would see grandma and all our aunts and uncles. Um, and uh, after I graduated from college, taught school, joined the Navy, spent 26 years as a naval flight officer, getting my wings right out here at NAS Pensacola. Um, when I decided to retire from the Navy, I was, at that time, the first woman to ever command a naval air wing. So uh, I retired here, and I started a nonprofit organization called the Global Corner. Many of you, if you have uh, kids or grandkids in elementary school, may recognize that name because we teach kids about other countries and cultures. Because we believe that when you get to know other people, they don't seem so different than us. Um, when I finished with that, I became a school board member, and uh, I think that's about it, uh, but I gotta go get studying now, sorry. <laughs> I'm Chip Simmons. Um, as many of you know, I was uh, 30 years at the Pensacola Police Department. I was, I'm a lifelong resident of Scambia County, graduated from Pine Forest High School, Pensacola Junior College. Um, I began my career in 1984 in, at the Scambia County Jail, certified corrections officer. I spent 29 years at the Pensacola Police Department, uh, the last 11 of which was as Assistant Chief and Chief of Police. Um, I believe so heavily in transparency that uh, I instituted the accreditation program, the first one that the Pensacola Police Department has ever had, and the body cameras. To this date, the only regional uh, law enforcement agency that has the body cameras. Um, and I just want, to, just so you know, it wasn't as easy as, as you would think. I mean, some, not everyone was a, was a fan of it. But we're a fan of transparency, and we're a fan of doing uh, doing what is right, and, and we understand that we were not perfect, but we were certainly willing to, to have a conversation, and much like we're having here now, and, and if, if you have concerns, to listen, listen to those concerns. I went from, I was, uh, I retired from the Pensacola Police Department, and went to work for Scambia County Board of County Commissioners for about a year and a half before I was hired at the Scambia County Sheriff's Office as Chief Deputy over Operations, which is patrol and investigations. I was brought over because of my expertise in narcotic enforcement and uh, gun crime and uh, violent crime enforcement, and for the most part, my experience in working with the neighborhoods and with the communities, and my willingness to get out um, and talk to the communities. As many of you know, um, I, I never turned down an invitation, and, and that's where we want to go with the sheriff's office. We want we want to help everyone in this Canby County to be uh, the best and safest neighborhood that they can be, and we can't do that alone. Not, very few things happen on its own. We understand. I've been around long enough to see some transformations, and I, and I know that how those took place. And, the, and none of them take place without a dialogue and openness and a transparency and a willingness to say, hey, let's have that conversation, that open conversation, and let's do what we think is right. Because we all want to live in a community and a neighborhood and a county that is, that is as safe as it possibly can be. Thank you. Good evening. I'm uh, Judge Tom Dehnheiser. I'm standing up because I'm a little height challenge, so everybody can see that. And I've, I've got a similar uh, biography to Judge Williams. I was born and raised here. In fact, we went to school together at the Booker T. Washington High School. Some of you may not realize it, it was on Tahar uh, before uh, Mr. McCorvey was the principal of the new one. And uh, went to University of Florida. In fact, with Judge Williams, we used to drive back and forth from Gainesville together. Um, I think we were limited to 55 miles an hour back then. <laughs> but, and, and I was uh, a prosecutor for a few years in South Florida. Came up here, assistant county attorney in Scambia. And I was Santa Rosa county attorney for quite a while before becoming a county judge here. And now I'm a circuit judge. As circuit judge, previously I uh, handled felony cases and civil cases. Now I'm in the family law division for a couple of years, so that's a, a new, interesting area for me. And so, if you, whether you like my rulings or you dislike them, you can blame or thank Mr. McCorvey because he was my civics teacher at Workman <laughs> High School. So, so, so it's all on. Him. And he was, I think he was about 13 when he was a civic station. <laughs> so, and I, I want to thank uh, the commissioner for inviting the judges out, because I think 
people need to know the judges because, you know, we're in positions that really have impact on people's lives. People's lives. Uh, people need to come to the courthouse more. It's not a bubble. It's not prohibited. It's the people's building. We need to come there, see what happens. We need feedback. You know, we're not perfect. I spoke to a uh, civic group a couple of years ago, in fact, read them the names of the 20 year, 16 to 20 judges we have here, and asked to raise their hand for every name they recognized. And most people didn't know the names of 80 to 90 percent of the judges. And, you know, we have to make important decisions that can take someone's children, take your liberty, take your money. And so, and we're public officials, we're elected, we need as much review and input as anybody else. And as county attorney, I remember the public would always show up for a zoning meeting or this or that. And those are important, but often not as important as the decisions that go on in the courthouse. And I just want to encourage everyone to come in the courthouse and uh, be educated, and we need the feedback. So I just appreciate being here tonight, and thanks a lot. Good afternoon. Good evening, rather. It is a pleasure to be here today for this forum, and I want to thank Commissioner May for inviting me. Uh, I have known him a very long time, and uh, his father and I was college students together. As a matter of fact, we rode from Pensacola to Tallahassee, attending college for many years, and uh, they were very little children at the time. But let me say, I am the representative for District 3 for the ECUA. And I am sad to say that I don't see many of you at our meetings. We have our meetings on the last uh, Thursday of each month. We change the time several times, hoping that you, we would increase the attendance but we still haven't seen you. But let me tell you this. We do a lot of things at ECUA, and you need to be involved. And how do you get involved? By coming to the meetings, or calling me and let me know what your concerns are before we take the action. Because once we take the action, uh, I don't wanna say it's too late, but it's tough to reverse things that we have done. One of the things that uh, I am very proud of that we have done here uh, since I've been on the, uh, the board at ECUA, we moved the wastewater treatment plan, plant from downtown Pensacola. And I have not heard any praises from you about that. We don't have a smell It was not an easy job. We had to come up with $316 million to move that plant, which was not an easy chore. But I can tell you, we got it done. We got it done, it was tough, and I would invite any of you to visit our new wastewater treatment plant out in uh, the Cantonment area. It is a very beautiful facility, and not only that, we have people coming from all over the world to look at what we have done here in Escambia County, because it is the best treatment, one of the best, let me put it that way, treatment plant in the world. Uh, we also have a compost facility out there, and if you don't know what compost is, compost is the making of material uh, into uh, a, a, a substance that you can use on your flowers, uh, on your, in your garden, if you have a garden, and uh, it's very cheap. It's very cheap. And I would encourage you to use some of our compost. <laughs> the other thing is a recycling facility. We have one of the best recycling facilities in the country, here in Escambia County. We have received national acclaim 
file a recycling system. And why is that recycling system so important? It is important because our landfill does not have a bottomless pit. We can't continue to dump garbage in that landfill because it is going to fill up. So what do we do? We take a lot of the garbage out of the landfill, well, we take it before it gets in the landfill, and we run it through our recycling facility, and it is reused. So that's one of the things we do. The other thing is we protect your drinking water. We have some of the best drinking water in this region of the country. And you can rest assured, no matter what you hear, so you can hear a whole lot of stuff out on the street corners, but you need to come and see what our drinking water, how the good quality of our drinking water. You know, many of you go out and buy bottled water, and I challenge any of you to take that bottled water you are drinking and bring it to our lab and let it be tested against our water, and I can assure you, you will lose every time, okay? So you can stop throwing away your money on the bottle of water, okay? I'm serious. I am very serious about that because I go to people's houses and they got all these plastic bottles of water stacked up on the, on the, the shelves there, you know, and, and they just think it's, they're getting better quality. No, you're not getting better quality. Okay, Mr. Corey, we need to move on. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, we got two minutes. Okay. The last thing is, be sure to come and visit us on the fourth Thursday of every month. Thank you. Thank you. Amy, you got one minute. Good evening. Thank you all for being for coming out. My name is Amy Lavoy. I am the assistant county administrator for the county. I work for Jack Brown. I'm also the budget director. I'm a lifelong Pensacola resident and a product of Escambia County Schools. And if you don't like the county budget, you can also blame Mr. McCorvey as he was my vice president, vice president of my school. I want to take a quick second to recognize a very hardworking and very dedicated group of county staff back there in the corner. And Leroy disappeared, so Leroy too. And David up in the back corner. I want to say thank you all for the work you did. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here tonight. My name is Kevin Brown, and I'm from Memphis, so I guess I'm the only person up here that Mr. McCorvey didn't teach girl night. So sorry about that. But I'm here representing uh, Senator Doug Broxson. Um, Senator Broxson represents all of Escambia County, Santa Rosa, and a portion of Okaloosa. Uh, our office deals with a wide array of different constituent issues that you might have, whether it be uh, state permits, DEP, uh, Department of Revenue, driver's licenses. Um, we're happy to help anywhere we can. But our office is 418 West Garden Street, not too far from here in the Pensacola State College building. So if you ever need anything, uh, be sure to drop by. But thank you, Commissioner May, for having us tonight. Thank you, Dr. Wharton, uh, for hosting us here. And I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to beautiful Brownsville. Um, I'm Scott Lasser, Stanley County Tax Collector. Last year, we processed 96,000 driver license transactions in our county and over 450,000 title and registration transactions. So we're busy. It's obvious when you drive by our offices. We spent the last year trying to reimagine what a tax collector in the 21st century should look like. So what we're doing is we're backing up to the point that you would first think, I need a tax collector to help me with this transaction or that, and trying to decide, do you really need us at the office? Is it something you can do online? Is it something we can start from your home and then finish at the office? So that's the uh, direction that we're heading in. Uh, one of the underlying themes that we ask every time we do something is does it meet the Evanwood test? Does it meet the Brownsville test? What about the people with the least resources can we give them the services they need? So again, we're backing up trying to get down to good customer service, make it available online, and those things for you. Uh, in addition, we collect property taxes. Uh, we've done about 400, or 400 million so far to date. We issue gun permits at our Warrington and Molina offices. We issue Florida birth certificates. 
at our Marcus Point and Molina offices. So we give quite a uh, variety of services. And uh, uh, again, just by updating our web pages, we've seen 60% increases in some transactions, which helps us reduce the lines in the facility. So uh, again, pleasure to be here with that Commissioner May, and I do want to put a quick plug in for the facility. We've used it several times for our training, and the staff seems to work with. Everything's been top notch, so we appreciate y'all for that. Thank you. My name is Gerald Wingate, and I'm a native Pensacolian. Uh, when I got out of high school, I went to the Air Force, and after that, I went into the Army, and I retired as a military officer from the Army. I spent uh, 40 years working in the paper industry here, and then I decided I would run for public office. And with the help of uh, Lumen May, I ran along with him during one of his campaigns. I guess people saw me with Loomis so much they decided to vote for me too. <laughs> but in the city of Pensacola, we, we're steadily working on uh, economic development and bringing jobs to the city of Pensacola. The VTMAE warehouse is going to be starting up, or the hangar rather, is going to be starting up next month. And that's uh, 400 jobs for the city of Pensacola. I went to a meeting this afternoon where we're trying to get a business to come into the port of the city of Pensacola. The port hasn't been doing very much the last couple of years, but we're trying to get a company to come and locate there. And at the airport today, uh, Frontier Airline had their ribbon cutting this afternoon to bring a new airline into the city of Pensacola. The city of Pensacola is growing and we need everybody's help to keep continuing to improve the quality of life in the city of Pensacola. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, now we know the danger of giving a politician a mic. Uh, we've gone 50 minutes. Uh, there's one person we did not recognize that we should recognize right now, and I, I think we'd be amiss not to recognize Mary May for being here for all that she's done for this side of the community, for trying to keep women somewhat straight. I do, we do the best we can, but, so Mary, please. <laughs> Took care of that one for you, sir. All right, the, uh, we've got, I've got a few questions that I'm gonna read that, that y'all have submitted, and then we'll open it up and give you a chance to come forward and ask questions. What I'd like to try to do is, let's go about 30, 45 minutes uh, to get these questions in, and then we'll we'll stop. Let you let you if you have individual questions, like the superintendent said, have an opportunity to to go and, and talk to them about it. Also about individual questions. Uh, the first question, and one reason Commissioner May likes to bring a lot of people because he doesn't think he's going to get any questions. So the first question is for Lumen May, uh, Commissioner. Please state your position and significant and the significance of mass transit to District Three, the entire county. Independence on economic development and creating local jobs. Rick, this is the last time you're going to facilitate anything for me. I can do my own facilitating. You might ask me a question. I've been very clear on where I stand on public transportation. Uh, I've been an advocate for it. I, I said we don't need to uh, decrease the amount of public transportation. We need to improve the efficiencies. And so we don't need to decrease routes. We need to improve the efficiency of the routes. And so does it mean we take natural gas? Do we get rid of larger buses and bring about vans or caravans? Oh, we can do it. I mean, if Uber can do it in, in, in the economic world, in the private sector, suddenly we can bring about efficiencies in the public sector. Thanks, Fred. I'm not going to be as long as somebody else. <laughs> All right, this is for uh, Chief Deputy Chip Simmons. What should I do when I see or suspect prostitutes on my street or other streets, or see or suspect drug deals? Can you hear me? Yeah. Now, that's a great question. It's a question we get all the time. Uh, what, do I, what do I do if I see prostitution, we suspect prostitution, or drug dealing? Well, you give us a call. Don't go there yourself. Don't go and make citizens arrest. Don't, don't hold them down for us and wait till we get here. <laughs> what we'd like for you to do, we have, we have a couple avenues. You can call our dispatch, not an emergency number if it's a non-emergency. You can call 911 if it's an emergency. We can call Crime Stoppers 433 STOP. The information gets to us. You might even get you a couple of dollars from it. But we understand that we can't do the job alone. That we need people that, that, that have eyes in the community. And you give us a call and let us know when we can put that small piece, even if we don't make an arrest, we can put that small piece with the other pieces we got 
and eventually we have uh, we have a, a case file, and we have uh, something that we can go to a judge judge with judge with, and say, hey, we need to kick this door in because we think these guys are doing drugs or doing other, some other kind of illicit illicit material, um, and and that's just that simple. But what you do is you let them know you're not going to tolerate. Don't just close the doors to shut the blinds. Don't just go to the neighborhood watch and say, hey, I, I'm tired of all those prostitutes, prostitutes. I'm tired of all that drug dealing. Give us a call and let us know. And then you can let go, go with that information to our neighborhood association. And you can grill me. You can grill my commanders and let us know, hey, I called a hundred times. Nothing's going on. And I'll let you know what we can do. Bottom line is, give us a call. We'll be glad to help you out. Uh, this is for Councilwoman Jewel Canada Wynn. How would you encourage our teen youth to keep active in their local government and community? What has been your efforts in reaching out to this group? Can you hear me? Okay, a, a couple of things that, that I think are important. Uh, first of all, is a Teen Search program. We, um, I facilitated the Teen Search program at Scammy High School. I encourage the Teen Search program. What the Teen Search program is, it is a program that helps students become involved uh, in their neighborhoods after a disaster or in case of an emergency. They get 20 hours of community service work. Uh, when they participate in that program. And when any type of disaster comes, or any type of need where the search and rescue, students are able to do that. Uh, it is uh, supposed to be rolled out in our parks and regs. So it is a free program. It's not something that's paid for. It is something that, uh, that you go, you sign up for. The next thing is I do Government Day. And Government Day uh, includes all students from all, this, all high schools in the district. Uh, sometimes they can participate because this is testing time. And so they come down to the city of Pensacola. We try to include all of our uh, elected officials. However, because we have to get our kids back at school so they can catch the bus. Uh, the last time we did it, we included our judiciary. This year we had to exclude our judiciary, but we included the school board because they wanted to talk to their school board officials. So we will have that day, April 30th of this year, at the City Hall, uh, and the kids will learn about their government. Okay, thank you. This is for Commissioner May. We suffered damage through the 2014 floods in our Inslee neighborhood. The drainage next to our property washed out and took our fence with it. We cannot fix our fence until the washouts are fixed. What can we expect and when? The good thing about it is we have a great county staff, uh, and, and we make a lot of policies. I tell you, probably uh, the best guy I've ever seen going at it and addressing those issues is Wes. Wes, would you address it? Absolutely. My name is Wes Moreno. I'm the Deputy Director of Public Works for Escambia County. And that's a great question. There's not an address on the car, but we're happy. I can have some staff out there first thing in the morning to take a look and assess that. I'll be, uh, I'll be available after the meeting and just come up to me if you want to give me your address and I'll make sure we, we take a look at it, get it assessed, and we get you in the right, uh, right loop for the proper action. Thank you. Thanks, Wes. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Morris, if you would just see Wes at the end of the night, he'll address your concerns. And if not, please give me a call. All right, this is for State Attorney Bill Edmonds. Why do you oppose the direct file? Why do you feel juveniles should be tried as adults? Well, I believe that the juveniles that I've transferred to adult court should be prosecuted as adults. 95% of the times that I've transferred juveniles, the judges have sentenced those people as adults. They, the judge at the end of the case, after he knows all of the information about the case, rather than at the beginning when he knows very little, still has the right to sentence the person that I've transferred to adult court as a juvenile. In fact, the judge is required to allow the juvenile authorities to do a juvenile investigation as well as an adult investigation. So I feel that the decisions that I've made have been good decisions. I have been more aggressive about transferring juveniles to adult court than many other state attorneys, but I have done so because we have tried to separate out the people that have failed in juvenile court, in other words, that have a record, We've tried to look for people that have committed violent crimes, and we've tried to look very carefully at people that are older, that are almost adults. 
Uh, as a result of the uh, concern in the community, I have shifted my focus somewhat and transferred fewer uh, of the uh, juveniles that are close to being adults. Uh, I'm leaving more of them in juvenile court. I understand that there is concern in the community. It's been expressed to me. I've listened to that and I've adjusted to it. I would indicate too that several, many years ago, the trend in transferring juveniles in my office was going down. And a few years ago, we had an outbreak of street gangs that were juveniles that were committing uh, voluminous amounts of car burglaries and uh, home burglaries. As a result, I decided to take it, that I would take a very aggressive approach uh, with those juveniles, which, which I have done. Since then, the number of juveniles that have been transferred to adult court has actually begun to trend back down. I feel that my office is very careful and really tries to focus on who needs to be prosecuted aggressively and who needs to be given a break. And that brings me to probably one, of, certainly one of the most important uh, decisions that I've had the opportunity to make as your state attorney. And that was to adopt a system of civil citations for juveniles that commit low level misdemeanors and have no prior record. That system of civil citations, in other words, we don't arrest them. We don't put them into the criminal justice system. We have a system set up where we give them counseling and uh, have them make restitution if necessary and take other actions before they actually get to the criminal justice system. And that's been one of the most successful programs that has ever been adopted in Scambi County. And I'm proud of it. It brings our justice system back to a system where it's like it was when I was young, where you didn't have this zero tolerance and you had uh, a system of, of uh, justice that allowed people to be treated leniently if they deserve to be treated leniently. So in closing, again, I want to emphasize how proud I am of the civil citation system. I know from talking with these uh, school people that that system has really been effective for them as well. Thank you. This is to Superintendent Malcolm Thomas and School Board Representative Lee Hansen. I've been living since 1972 in District 3. I've, district 3 has always been considered the poorest district the question is, why has nothing been done to help upgrade the district? Well, in terms of upgrading the schools in your district, we've done a great deal. We've built new schools. We've replaced old buildings that were deteriorating. We have invested literally millions of dollars into Title I programs, additional support, after-school programs. I think one shining example right now is the community school at Wise Elementary. Uh, we just released today because we just found out that Wise Elementary is now the first certified community school in the state of Florida at the elementary level, and that's in Scambia County. That was an investment that we made. Certainly we didn't do it alone. It takes partnerships. Uh, partners, uh, Scambia Community Clinic, who is here tonight, was a big partner in that setting up a pediatrician office in the school. Just opportunities that we're doing to mitigate some of those some of those activities that might keep a child out of school. You have an abscess tooth, kind of hard to learn, you know, run, Jane, run, uh, because your tooth is hurting. You've got to have that dealt with. If you're, if you're hungry, that becomes a situation you have to address. Uh, most of the schools in District 1, I, I want to say all, but before I say all, I'll just say most, are on 100% free breakfast and free lunch, trying to help those communities take one more burden off the family and make sure that those students receive adequate nutrition. So we have built programs, we have invested resources, uh, but what we can change is that economic climate in that area of our community. That's gonna take more than the school system. Uh, that takes all of us working together, achieve a Scambia, United Way, government, all working to increase opportunities for adults so that they can raise the standard of living in that home. That's gonna change the economics. And uh, I would like to add just a couple of things because uh, Superintendent Thomas is right. There's a lot going on in the schools and if you haven't been there recently, you probably need to go take a visit. 
Um, as I said, I started a nonprofit organization, so I've been in the schools for the last 12 years or so, and it's amazing to me to see some of the changes. And I'll give you one example. Out at Lincoln Park, I don't know how many of you are from that neighborhood, but I'll tell you that years ago, when my little sister from Big Brothers Big Sisters was going there, I didn't like going there to pick her up. It was very intimidating. There were, there were signs on the door that said, you know, don't come in unless you have a reason or something like that. It was very, very uh, unfriendly. Now, it's an amazingly different place. It's a place that you want to go, that you feel welcomed going to. So there are changes out there that are happening. Um, the other thing that I'll say is that one of the things that I'm very interested in as a school board member is first of all knowing what's going on in the schools, but second, we have some wonderful things that are going on in the community. The Studer uh, Community Institute has been working with parents on parenting and, and making sure that parents are empowered and they know that they are the best teachers. They are the ones who start from zero and bring that child up. And so I'm going to make sure, as I move through the next uh, several months at least um, in the office, that we leverage the things that are going on in different parts of our community to make sure we're bringing that into the schools as well. Because those parents have younger children, and I want to make sure that those kids have an opportunity to do well at home so they can do well in school. Thank you. Uh, this is Commissioner Bang. We've got three questions that are going to combine them into one. Uh, I think they're all on the same point. Uh, where do you stand on giving away our public beaches to private uh, owners and developers? Uh, will, you, will you advocate tonight that you believe, will you announce that you will believe, that you believe Pensacola beaches should remain public? And will you support a referendum on the August ballot to let the citizens vote on it? Unfortunate, unfortunate, all the yellow shirts have left and they come every Thursday and I've probably said the same answer for the last nine months. Uh, I believe that public access is critical. Uh, I, I grew up uh, listening to my parents and my aunt talk about Johnson Beach and Wingate Beach uh, when minorities didn't have the opportunity to go uh, to Pensacola Beach. And so uh, many of those that I serve and represent uh, cannot afford uh, to buy condos or even rent hotels on the beach. So it's, it's paramount, it's critical to me uh, that we preserve every opportunity of public access to our beaches. Thank you, Randy. All right. I'll do that. All right. This is for Councilwoman Jewel Kennedy Wynn and Councilman Gerald Wingate. When the lease for Bruce Beach comes back to the City Council for amendment, will you continue to support this lease with Florida Fish and Wildlife? Yes. I think it was a good decision to use that property to uh, put the fish hatchery on. And I think it's going to be a, a good facility for the community if it does um, get done. Uh, we haven't heard anything recently, even after the uh, court case, uh, as to whether the fish hatchery is going to move forward or not. Uh, yes, I, I support the having the fish hatchery there. Not only have the fish hatchery there, but also the amenities that will go along with it. Uh, there are about two million dollars worth of amenities that will go along with it, the acknowledgement of the history of Boots Beach, as well as public access down to the water. I think it also will be an educational part for our kids. Uh, you know, some people say it's going to smell, you know, I, I say I can go down to a fish market and I can see people eating ice cream. I said, so, uh, it, I think that is very, very important. Uh, another issue there is 18 to 20 million dollars. The city of Pensacola, you the taxpayer, you're not putting this bill. This bill is coming from our Fish and Wildlife. It is a grant. Uh, it would help us to improve that area. I think it would add a lot to our west side. And, and yes, I will support it. However, there's a partner there, and so we have not heard uh, how we're going to move forward. So I hope that we do move forward, but I'm ready to still support it. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is the math part of the uh, of the night. Chief Deputy, all right, what's the cost of housing an inmate for a year, and what's the starting pay for a deputy? 
Well, I, uh, I left the county a year and a half ago. I don't know if the, uh, if the cost of housing a deputy. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, housing, <laughs> housing a housing Not deputy. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, 35, about 35000 for a starting deputy. I will tell you that uh, the cost of housing a, a, an inmate is going to be is a little difficult because there's two two specific numbers. If you just take the total total number uh, total cost of um, the cost of incarceration for everyone divided by the number of inmates, that gives you one number. But what we're wanting to know is if you take one inmate out, how much money do we save? Well, what you're really only going to save with that one inmate is the cost of, of three meals and perhaps the cost of the, the jump that suit they get. So you have to dig a little deeper to come up with the exact cost of what it uh, what it would mean. Now if you're if you're looking for if we take out 20 or 30 or 40 inmates, will we will we be able to to um, shut down a pod or, a, or an area and then lay off those deputies or put those deputies, those corrections officers somewhere else? That's a more difficult question. I have to refer to that. Probably Amy might know that number a little bit better. But it's always, even when I was with the county, the question is always, well, how much does it cost? And because easy, easy math is that you take the total number divided by the number of inmates, and that's what the cost of incarceration is. But it's not really the case because, again, if you take one inmate out, you can't lay off a deputy, you can't shut down a kitchen, you can't shut down a, 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 um, a the, the dental chair or anything like that. So that's. That's the best that I can that I can give you. I think that there, it ranges somewhere around seventy dollars a day per inmate. It was, and I think that the actual cost for pulling one out was probably about twenty-five to thirty-five dollars for that. Thank you. Can I, can I follow up on that? Yeah, sure. I just want to say the the county and the sheriff's office have been uh, real uh, progressive in trying to look at alternatives, and the county. Uh, thankfully, it's funded a lot of programs that can get the appropriate inmates out on GPS or drug testing or, or such programs that are obviously, one, financially beneficial to the county, but also most of the time financially beneficial to the community. Someone keeps their job, that's obviously a plus. But the uh, county and the sheriff's office have been and working with the judges to the extent we can to to help uh, lower those uh, correction costs. Thank you. Superintendent Thomas, you're part of the math quiz. Uh, what are the, the teachers starting pay? And do you have an idea what the, the cost of educating a student a year is? The teacher starting pay is about $38,000, and the cost of the student will depend upon the student. Obviously, if you have a very severely disabled youngster that's gonna require physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, and a very small class size with multiple adults in the room, that student's gonna cost more to educate. That student may cost you over $30,000 a year. An average general education student that doesn't have those kinds of issues, you're about $5,000 to $6,000 a year. Okay, thank you. All right, this is um, for Ch Chip Simmons and, and for Bill Eden, the state attorney. Uh, how can we change the narrative of so many of our African-American men and women are being incarcerated because of marijuana? How can we get their records expunged when they're released? Well, I'll address part of that. I question uh, how many people are being incarcerated for possession of marijuana. Uh, most of the time, in the justice system we have, you got to possess something a lot stronger than marijuana to get incarcerated. We have diversionary programs, we have probation, we got community control, uh, we have drug court, we have veterans court, uh, we have mental health court, so we have a lot of options for people that have drug issues, and they do uh, have a lot of drug issues. Uh, I believe that the justice system it ha is very complex. I agree with Judge Danheiser that the county and the judges have really worked hard and have been very progressive about trying to identify who needs to be in jail and who doesn't. I think that's a great focus. I think that progress is being made. I think the system can do a better job of making that decision as far as who needs to be in jail uh, and who doesn't. Uh, I believe I'm not a, a I'm not good at policy. I'm more of a mechanic. I do my job and I look at individual cases and try to be consistent. 
say across the board, but in my experience, one of the areas where there is room for the greatest progress and the greatest improvement is helping people when they are getting ready to get out of jail or when they have gotten out of jail. We have some programs here. Uh, local REAP is, uh, is one that helps people get established, uh, get jobs, get a place to live, helps them get uh, education, helps them with counseling for emotional or, uh, or drug problems. But I feel like that the state could do a lot more, could do a lot better. I also feel like that there's a, that there's, is, that there's a, a fresh breeze blowing in Scandia, Florida, or County, Florida. I feel like that we have good leadership all the way around. And I feel like that this issue of trying to help people that have fallen into uh, the, the jail, the justice system, yeah, it has room for improvement. I feel like we've taken some steps to make uh, improvement in that area, and I feel like, that, and I compliment uh, the county and the judges for uh, working to be as progressive as they are to do that. Yeah, I, I, um, I would agree. I think that there's this, this narrative that the jail is full of individuals who had one marijuana joint or they had one, um, you know, one small amount of marijuana and that's the only thing keeping them in jail. That's just not true. I was the chief corrections officer for over a year and every, day, every week I would ask for a list of those who were uh, in jail, incarcerated for $500 a bond and less and $1,000 and less. And not a single time did I see a single individual that's only in jail for marijuana. That, that's just not true. This is what we're seeing. In the past, I spent a lot of times as a narcotic officer, 12 years. And in the past, we've seen, we would stop somebody or we'd do a, a search warrant on someone and we'd see one special specialty crime uh, or, or you know, crack cocaine and we'd see marijuana individually. Now we're not seeing that anymore. It's almost always a mix. It's not just a mix of marijuana, it's a mix. They got cocaine, they got heroin, they got opiates, they got uh, you know, marijuana, they got everything. And so we take them to jail, and yes, marijuana may be a charge, but also possession of cocaine, possession of heroin, possession with intent to distribute. These are the ones that stay in the jail because their bonds are higher. If we stop somebody and they have uh, one joint or if they have um, you know, a, a, a pipe, marijuana smoking pipe, the, the, the deputy has discretion. They don't always have to arrest in that situation. Now, you let them know you can hey, use your discretion then. But these are not the individuals that are taken to jail. These are not the individuals that get a high bond. These are not the individuals that are sitting over there in jail right now. It's just not happening. I know it's not happening. I've seen it. I asked for the details, and that's not happening. But that doesn't do you any good if you're stopped and you happen to have a little bit of marijuana. I understand that. And as uh, Mr. Edden said, there, there are a lot of movements towards, let's, let's take a look at what we're incarcerating people for. And, and we're proud to be a part of that. But the law enforcement agency, we don't create legislation. What we do is we enforce it. And, and again, if you hear that people are locked up for a marijuana joint or misdemeanor marijuana amount in the jail, don't believe them. Contact the county. They'll be glad to let you know because that's just not happening. I'd like to add to that two sure. points if I could. Again, I mentioned that the county has been very supportive and very progressive and made efforts to improve the, uh, to accurately identify the people that need to be in jail and the ones that don't. They have a system, a pretrial release system, a pretrial services system where they evaluate people when they get arrested and request that they be released without bond on pretrial release. And it's set up so that they have people that supervise them, they report into them and so forth. The county has released approximately 1,000 people without any bond and some of those people could be a low-level uh, defendant with a marijuana charge. The other thing that the county has done is they contacted my office and said there's a number of people in jail that are in jail because they have low bonds and they're too poor to get out. And I said, well, let's develop a system where we evaluate that and minimize that to the extent possible. So we've implemented the system where every week the county, the county jail, operated by the county now, sends me a list of people that have low bonds, and I've designated an assistant state attorney uh, that reviews that list to determine if there's anybody on that list that we feel like that we can uh, 
go to the judge and say, let's release, release these people without bond. And almost every week we find some people that we can do that. So I feel like, uh, in closing, I feel like that there's very few people in jail for uh, just marijuana. And I feel like that the county and the justice system has been very progressive in, in uh, making efforts to identify the people that need to be in jail and the people that don't. Okay, thank you. Uh, the commissioner reminded me that we, we're gonna allow everyone to have a, a minute uh, for y'all to get a chance to kind of sum up tonight uh, and we'll open up for y'all to individually meet with the members. Commissioner May and we'll, we'll wrap it up. We worked through the majority of the questions and my goal is to hit the time zone so I'm trying to do that. Uh, Mr. Winyak, you had to go last, but you go first. It's, good. it's a real minute, not an Elvin recording. <laughs> Well, the, the thing that I say that we need to try to do is people in the neighborhoods and community uh, organize and come and tell your government what you need. Come and tell us what the problems are. Uh, there are um, neighborhood groups that come down and we've taken uh, one or two hours some nights just listening to the people that come in from the neighborhoods that have a a problem that they want to get resolved. If you don't feel like you, need, you have the things you need in your community, you need to try to organize your community group and uh, complain to the government entity that's over you, whether it's the city or the county, or if you have an issue with the sheriff's department, you know, bring it to people's attention so that they, they can do something about it. Scott Lunsford, Camden County Tax Collector. I'll let go. We get um, citizens to reach out to us daily, and we look at each one of those, try to find out what happened, how we can be better, how we can resolve those issues. But we'd love to hear from you in regards to our office. I will say we have staff out front, and they'll be glad to answer any questions. I'll be here as long as someone's here to talk. Uh, we've got several different programs out there that we've picked off this year, so please stop by and see what we're offering. Thank you. Well, thank you again for being here tonight. Um, if, if there are any issues afterward, uh, feel free to come talk to me. Uh, you know, kind of uh, state-related issues, or uh, if you want to drop by our office again, we're in the PSC building on guard. But uh, the good news is the same as the bad news, which is that the legislature meets every year, so uh, we can always do a better job. So just tell us what to do. Thanks. I just wanted to say thank you again for all coming out. This is a powerful message, more than you realize when you come out, when citizens come out there and just voice their opinions. So I want to say thank you all for coming out, and thanks again to the county staff and David up there for, for all your work. Again, I would like to say to you that uh, if you have problems in your neighborhood, come see us. We can't solve the problems if you don't tell them to us. So please call or come to see us at ECUA, and we'll be glad to work with you to try to resolve your problem. I don't think there is a pr person who can say that they have contacted me and had a problem, and we did not resolve it. Thank you. That's what I think for uh, inviting uh, me and Judge Williams here tonight. I really want to stress, I encourage everyone, to go to the courthouse, watch a trial, go to a bond hearing, the violation of probation hearing so you can know firsthand how the system operates. Judges obviously can't talk about individual cases, but we can talk about general issues. If you have a question about how the system works, you know, what's happening, what are the trends, you can talk to any of you. We're elected officials. We're supposed to be responsive like anyone else. Feel free to talk to the judges, talk to the staff in the courthouse. But um, that's how you learn how to learn how what is really happening, you don't rely on rumors, just walk down there, it's a public building, and hope to see uh, many of you in the courthouse. In <laughs> <laughs> If um, you're a resident of Scambia County, and I am, and, and, and we do something as, as a sheriff's office, my first question is, is that how you treat a member of your family? In fact, I say it so much in my office to my, to my guys, they, they start to wonder what kind of family I have, if we're always getting stopped, and, and, and I'm always evaluating that. But it's because we want, we want to provide a service that is courteous, that's professional, and, and we understand that that's a difficult job. 
we also understand that arresting somebody, wrestling somebody, chasing somebody is never pretty. It never is. We have an obligation for the safety and protection of the citizens of Escambia County. We're going to do that job, but we're also going to do it with courtesy when, uh, when we can, and we're going to do it in as a professional manner as we possibly can. And as everyone else has said, if you feel like we can do better, give us a call. Let's talk about these individual events. We are not perfect. We're always looking for ways to get better because we live in this community as well. Thanks. Um, as your District 3 school board representative, I just want to let you know that one of my, my goals as I serve you is to make sure that everyone in not only District 3, but everyone in Escambia County and the region understands that what happens here affects us all. So it's not that district, it's our district, it's our kids. So I need your help to make sure that I do the best job that I can. And since I work for you and you're my boss, let me know how I can do a better job. Thanks. Um, thank you, thank you for showing up. Thank you for being a part of how government's supposed to work. This is how it should work. This is how it's supposed to work. Civil discourse, we the, the elected representatives meeting face-to-face uh, -face in a neighborhood with you, the people who elect us. Let us not forget all of our problems. We live in the greatest country in the history of the world. But the, the main part of that, the, the most responsible, the people that are most responsible for that are you. The greatest privilege that we have, all of us, are to choose those who lead us. That's what you do in elections. That's what we facilitate. That process where everybody walks into a voting booth, they are equal. Your vote counts as much as my vote, as much as anybody else's vote in here. It's anonymous. Once it's put in the tabulator, we don't know who cast it. You have a responsibility in this process. It has never been easier to register to vote, and it's never been easier to cast a ballot. Can it get easier? Can it get? Yes, it can, but it's never been as easy it is, as it is right now. But you have to take that initiative. You have to take the step. We're going to do everything that we can uh, to make it as, as accessible and available to you, but you ultimately have to make that decision that you want to cast a ballot. And if you make that decision that you want to cast that ballot, we're going to do everything we can uh, to help facilitate that and make sure it counts so that your will, your voice, uh, can be heard through the people that represent you. Thank you. I want to thank uh, each and every one of you. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, it is so important that you take control of your neighborhoods. I'm an advocate of neighborhoods and strengthening neighborhoods. I, I tell the groups that when they're trying to organize the neighborhood and you want to control, sometimes we just watch things come into our neighborhoods. We just watch those individuals that's selling drugs and, and not doing what your neighborhood, you think your neighborhood should be. We just watch them come in and we do nothing. But if you have a neighborhood association and you go up there to that door and you knock on that door and you have that apple pie and you said, thank you for coming into my neighborhood, I am ready for you to join our neighborhood association. So if you do not have a neighborhood association in, your, in, in where you live, create a neighborhood association. Organize your neighborhood association. You have power. You have strength. And so one of the things that I would like for you to do is to recognize that you have power, you have strength, and you have that power to change your neighborhood and to change this community. Thank you. I'd like to join the other people on the head table in thanking you for attending. It's been a great honor for me to work for you as your state attorney, and I've really tried to take every effort to adjust and always be progressing and to develop new ideas and new programs to, to divide between the people that need to go to jail and the people that need help. I want to comment in closing that uh, I've enjoyed the last few years of seeing a change in this community and in Escambia County. I feel now that we have very good leadership in the public sector. Uh, Lumen May is a great leader, and I also feel that we have leadership in the private sector that's brought in uh, new jobs, new buildings, 
And I believe that the future of Scambia County is greater than the past. I believe that we really have turned the corner. And I think the fact that you people have turned out like you have, this is amazing, really, to see a turnout like this uh, in the community center like this. I think that indicates that really this community is making great progress. Thank you. It's certainly been my pleasure to serve your children and your grandchildren over the last 10 years. I, I won't uh, beat around the bush. You know, what What challenges we have for this younger generation, they're, they're pretty steep. We have to prepare them for jobs that don't exist. The world is changing rapidly, and you can't do business like we used to do business. So, you know, we've instituted Chromebooks and technology from grade 3 to 12. Our graduation rates are improving. They were 55% 10 years ago. We're at 80% this year, on-time graduation rate. The group that's leading the charge on helping us get that increase, African-American students. Their graduation rate 10 years ago, 44% on-time, 71% last year. We're making progress. We're far from done. But if we're really going to accomplish what we have to accomplish for your children, for your grandchildren, my grandchildren, we're going to have to do that together. It can't just be what happens at school. We have to be partners. That means we need mentors. We need you. If you have a problem, call your principal. If you don't get a response, call the superintendent's office. We'll get you a response. But we are going to have to be in this hooked elbow to elbow. It's too important that we are divided when it comes to the education and future of our students. Thank you. without being compelled to do so by a Jewish summons. <laughs> and I would like to say up front too that we judges recognize, mentioning the Jewish service, that it's not necessarily convenient, but it is so important that you all do come down and do your civic duty to help us do our duty uh, with things, the way that things are in the world. And as said, I think it was, uh, Stafford, uh, this is best country going. And how we handle it starts in the judicial system, I think, or the legal system. Uh, so I will close out by saying the best way to describe, I think, our courthouse is the television show, The People's Court, to really you all. Let's do it for our panel real quick. And real quick, let's give it up. Rick Allison did a fabulous job. Rick, thank you for sitting this up. Thank you. So the young people who are here who are getting engaged, uh, uh, it just reminds me of having to go to church every Sunday uh, and didn't want to go. But it paid off in the end. So you keep coming to these meetings uh, and it'll pay off in the end. So it's great to see young people. I want to thank this great panel for being here. Uh, I mean, the absorbing nature of time for an elected official uh, is unimaginable until you get an elected office. And so to be able to have a state attorney, a judge, a circuit judge, uh, a legislator, uh, county people here, uh, it means a lot. So tonight, uh, before you go, we have our service providers, as I've said, ECC, area housing. Uh, ask your questions. I know many of the questions that have come tonight are uh, Rick Tri. We have more uh, that we couldn't get to. And this is not the last time. I'm going to continue uh, on my campaign pledge to bring the government to the people. Uh, you shouldn't have to come down all the time to the county commissioner's office and go to metal detectors to see your elected officials. Uh, we should come to you uh, because you pay us. And so we're going to continue to work with our partners in bringing government back to the people. Uh, the questions that we did not get an opportunity to ask, we will respond and send them to the appropriate people. But please, uh, I've asked each one of these officials uh, to give us a little time. Many of you call me all the time with judiciary questions. You have a circuit judge and a county judge. Take advantage of the state attorney and the superintendent. Take advantage of the tax collector uh, tonight. Uh, I'm telling you, if they want you to come ask some questions, as a matter of fact, if you don't have a question, go ask them a question because the person that doesn't get a question will feel very lonely driving home that they have no friends. So make sure that you ask David staff at least one voter ask you questions. So again, uh, we have drinks and water in the back. I would be remiss without thinking my staff are red and green. The county, with the county staff, please stand. Uh, Red have worked very hard to coordinate with uh, ECC, Matt, uh, Roy, and Michael Rose.
So if you have questions as it relates to parks and recs, uh, flooding, uh, our county staff, you'll see them here. They'll be very close to Amy. You can identify them because they're all taller than Amy. So everybody that's taller than Amy that's standing behind Amy, she's there. Well, Leroy left as he often does before work is over. So uh, 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 again, we want to thank uh, all of you for being here. Please ask the questions that you didn't get a chance to ask and join me in thanking uh, these very busy elected officials for joining us in our town hall. Thank y'all so much for being here. Please go up and ask the questions to your elected officials.